Space is a vast sea of stars and matter. And so vast it is that when a ship is lost, it is incredibly difficult to find it again. Unless the gods look favourably upon the crew of the ship and their rescuers. But this is a rare thing. And so often the ship ventures out into the void, full of hope and vigour. Its crew healthy and sound of mind. And they are never seen again. It happens to every civilised spacefaring species in the galaxy. And no doubt in other galaxies as well. Some do their best to mitigate the chances of a lost vessel. Others simply don't care and cross the names off their lists, forgotten immediately. And others, like humanity, never forget the ships they've lost. Sometimes even going so far as to create fantastical stories about the lost ships and their crews. This is the case with a particular ship, Lorchidea, or the Orchid in Galactic Basic. The Orchid was an old warship that had been retrofitted for colony establishment. It had most of its armament stripped, the more dangerous weapons removed, while leaving enough defences behind in the event of pirate attack. Its armour had been bolted up considerably, and warfighting systems were replaced with colonial management programmes. Entire cargo bays had been converted into colonist storage, protected from everything up to passing far too close to a star. Within, it held volunteers from humanity and the species that lived under their care. A thousand humans, a thousand souls, all meant for the fringes of the galaxy. They knew they would sleep the entire way there, guarded by machines built to preserve their lives and the ship around them. Each was a volunteer, eager to escape the known for the unknown, hoping to build a world as close to paradise as possible. Not for them, but for their children's children. A most noble dream. The ship slid from dock one fateful day, cargo secured and peacefully asleep, and made the jump to FTL, heading for the edge of the galaxy. For 600 years, the Orchid remained on scopes, well within the range of hyperluminal arrays. For 600 years, the galaxy watched and listened to the automated reports beamed from the colony ship. Till the reports stopped. All contact was lost with the ship. So suddenly that it couldn't have simply been destroyed or captured by a hostile species. It was just gone. Of course, it sent humanity into a panic frenzy. And thanks to advances in jump drive technology, their search fleets made the trip to the last known coordinates within weeks. They found no debris, no sign that the Orchid had been attacked and boarded. It had just vanished. It was at this point that the rest of the galaxy simply rode the ship off. It was lost, after all. No sense thinking and worrying about it. Humanity, though. It took a lot longer for humanity to give up. They exhausted nearly every avenue of thought they could in their attempt to find it and discover what exactly had happened. Each group met with failure after failure, but still they did not give up. But even for a species as stubborn as we are, there comes a point where one must step back and admit defeat. The Orchid wasn't forgotten. It was memorialised heavily across all major human worlds, the names of its crew and passengers displayed for all to see. And though it was a memorial and inspired in all who saw it, a sense of sadness, it was also a point of pride for humanity. Sure, it had ended in failure, but that was a risk they had been willing to take. They had represented some of the best humanity had to offer, and their sacrifice was not in vain, for humanity had followed their example and stretched their influence to the edge of the galaxy, doing what they had seemingly been unable to do. It did not take long for stories to begin cropping up about the lost ship. Rumours of sightings made by alien and human alike on the fringes of civilised space. Stories that were believable at first, but quickly grew into the realm of the supernatural. Stories of haunting voices in certain fringe systems, speaking of the Orchid and calling for help. They never panned out, just the ramblings of those who were sheltered in the void for a little too long. 
until 800 years after the Orcus disappearance. They did. Vask was busy dozing in his bunk when the alarm sounded. Not the piercing shriek of the combat alarm, but the deep booming sound of a proximity alert. They'd gotten too close to something far bigger than their merchant vessel, and that could be a major problem depending on what exactly this thing was. It could be an ambush laid by Paris, or perhaps a rogue comet that has somehow been hidden from sensors. Who knew? He certainly didn't, as he rolled out of his bunk, and nearly sprained his fur and scale-covered tail in the process. In moments he was dressed and at his station, which was the small room where certain supplies could be handed out. It wasn't a terribly important posting, but it had its perks, like being able to sit around and do nearly nothing all day long. At least, that's what he did when he didn't have to take inventory, or hand things out to the rest of the crew. Considering he was just a mere assistant as well, meant that he wasn't very important either. Not today, it seemed, for his personal comms pinged a tone that could only have come from the captain himself. Vask! Report to the starboard airlock immediately and suit up! The raspy voice of his captain spoke into his ear, and he was confused. Terribly, terribly confused. He was only here thanks to his cousin, and he'd been placed in a position that offered little danger in day-to-day -day activities. So why was the captain sending him to an airlock to get suited up? Surely there were better and more experienced people to do that sort of job. Still, he wanted to make his family proud by being the obedient hard worker, so he scampered from his post and headed for the starboard airlock. There, he slipped carefully into an Eva suit and ensured the seals were sound before speaking up. Suit it up and ready for orders, Captain, he squeaked. Whiskers bent against the sloped visor of his helmet, tail grasped snugly in a glove that allowed for full mobility and also supreme protection. About time. Your orders are as follows. Board the derelict vessel and see if there's any hope of salvage. We can't get the airlocks to connect, so you're going to have to float over. Don't freak this up or I'll have your hired. Vask winced slightly at the fret, but pinged a confirmation of his orders and depressurized the airlock, watching as the door slowly slid open onto the cold vacuum of space. His breathing quickened for a moment before the suit pumped him full of a calming agent, a non-addictive kind, thankfully. He let the suit systems detect the airlock he was supposed to get to and pushed himself out into space, the booster pack doing all the hard work for him. He finally got a good look at the ship he was boarding, and his mouth gaped in awe. Sure, he'd seen large ships before, but this was clearly a retrofitted dreadnought in both size and shape. A human one at that, a species known for making the largest, meanest, and most lethal warships in existence, and they were a mostly peaceful species as well. This one was clearly not a warship anymore. He could tell that much right away as it was not bristling with obscene amounts of weapons. Still, it looked as though it had taken quite a beating, just not from weapons. Instead, there were great dents in the armoured hull, large scrapes and tears in the plating that suggested impacts with space debris. The damage was so severe in one place, he could barely even see the registry. His time for study came to an end, as he reached the ship's airlock and took hold of a railing, hunting for the manual release. Finding it, he put every ounce of strength he had, and some of the suits as well, into pulling the lever. It snapped outward suddenly, nearly dislodging him from the side of the ship, but thankfully his glass were magnetised, affording him a far greater grip strength than he normally had. The airlock slid open, centuries of frost growth snapping and getting shot into the void. Vask held onto the railing as tightly as he could, hoping that nothing within would manage to break his hold on it. As luck would have it, there was nothing but empty space inside the airlock, so he had nothing to fear once the explosive decompression was done with. Slowly, he guided himself inside, a hint of nervousness making itself known in the quivering of his tail. He had no problems with space and either operations, 
the nervousness he experienced stemming from entering a derelict ship alone, without quick support should anything go wrong. Closing the doors behind him, he waited for systems to repressurize the airlock, only to find that they did not. With a frown, he opened the inner doors, and was not surprised to find that the rest of the ship was depressurized as well, though there was just a small amount of heat to be felt within the old halls. This is Vask. I'm inside. So far so good, he said, earning silence from his ship as he ventured forth, magnetized boots thudding dully against the metal deck. He did not find any signs of distress or even an attack. He found no corpses either, and the escape pods he came across were all snugly sitting in their berths. So he was left to wonder just what had gone wrong. Finally, he slipped through a partially open door and noted the layout, marking the room as nothing other than the bridge. Like everywhere else on the ship, it was empty, filled with dust and neglect, but still functional, or so he hoped. He stopped at a terminal and wiped the dust off the screen, watching as his presence and content with it sparked life within the terminal. It ran for a quick startup sequence, and then gave a proper display, indicating that it was an operations terminal, meant to handle day-to-day -day functions and not much else. Vask, we've got a situation developing. There's no time to pick you up. You're on your own. Vask blinked, brow furrowing in confusion as he peered out the main window of the bridge at his ship. C Captain, I don't understand. What kind of situation is there? He was cut off by the ship simply jumping away, only to be replaced with two other ships. These ones were no mere merchant ships, but pirates, and they had no doubt meant to snag his ship, but now had a fatter prize in their sights. Though the betrayal stung quite deeply, Vask was not about to let himself either be taken or killed by pirates, and yet he was no fighter, nor did he know much about ship-to-ship -ship combat either. Still, there was clearly power in this ship, and it was armed. Considering the lack of any visible and major damage, he figured that perhaps it would still make for a worthy opponent for these pirates. He had time as well. The pirates weren't drawing closer just yet, no doubt arguing over who got the lion's share of the spoils. Pirates weren't known for their ability to cooperate for too long, after all. So while they bickered, he frantically went to work, using the terminal that was already online to search for some sort of tactical system. When found it, he let out a wordless exclamation of joy, and tried his best to understand it, with much haste involved. It was a very simple system he discovered, as the really complicated stuff the computers handled themselves. All he had to do was designate targets, and press the button to fire when the time came. Firing solutions, ATMO loading and the like, were handled by the AI, not a truly sentient AI, but still an AI. He got the firing systems locked onto the two ships, and waited for the weapons themselves to activate. Though it was many centuries old now, the ship's armaments were still deadly, and much to the pirate's surprise, fully operational as well. Banks of turreted railguns broke free of their icy confines, and turned to stare at the ships. A baleful sort of stare it turned out to be, as the accelerator rails visibly charged up on over 20 cannons. The terminal reported the cannons were armed, primed and ready to fire, and so without much hesitation, Vast pressed the big red button that said, Fire. The result was near instantaneous. Ten cannons fired, another ten firing as well, each group focused on one ship. Twenty rounds of magnetically accelerated explosive armor-piercing slugs, streaked through the void and slammed into the pirates, who were only just raising kinetic shields, but these did little to stop the rounds that struck them. In moments, what had been two fully functional starships were reduced to perforated wrecks, the explosive charges detonating at random intervals after impact, blowing great chunks out of the hulls of each ship. A quick tactical scan revealed that not only were they dead in the water, the sheer concussive force of the explosives had flatlined everyone on board. 
Vask was alive, but he had also just killed for the first time. He didn't know how to feel. It was a lot less personal than killing with his bare hands, he knew that much, but still, he had just ended many lives. For a moment he entertained the hope that his ship, hopefully having detected the destruction of the two pirate vessels, would return for him, and they could keep salvaging this find. But after a few minutes with the merchant ship remaining a no-show, he felt his spirits start to flag, then plummet, precipitously. He staggered backwards, hopelessness and despair starting to set in. His subconscious remembered that the captain's chair was directly behind him, and he made to sit in it, only to feel something that wasn't a chair at all beneath him. Quickly he rolled around, and nearly screamed when his gaze fell upon the desiccated but well-preserved remains of a human in an environment suit, though one that was missing their helmet. The human looked at peace, head bowed forward and chin resting against their chest, as if they were merely asleep. Had they looked better, he might have assumed they were. Curiosity overrode despair as he moved closer to the first and only corpse on the ship, trying to get an idea of who they were and their function. After all, typically only the crew would have access to the bridge of any starship, human or otherwise. He couldn't see a name tag, so worn with age that the suit was more or less featureless, besides obvious panels and ports. What he did find, however, was a piece of metal that cut the back side of the human's right ear, one that was blinking gently with a pale blue light. He knew what that was. It was something that came standard with every human. It was a neural interface port, used to back up an entire lifetime's worth of experience and knowledge or to facilitate communication with others at the speed of thought, capable of presenting concepts in a manner that words simply could not express. It was a very old model, of course. Everything around him was. But still, it could prove valuable to Vask. Carefully, he pulled a data cable from the wrist of his suit and plugged into the port, watching as reams of data flow from the dead human into his own storage banks. The moment it finished, the human convulsed slightly, not thanks to any form of returning life, but because the augment shorted out, sending a surge through the human system that caused atrophied muscle to spasm. Vask jerked away, and was thankful he still had his helmet on, as there would surely have been the smell of centuries old flesh burning. And with that done, he would not disturb the corpse any further, instead taking a peek at the data he'd recovered. Most of it was private affairs, things nobody should go poking around in. But other parts were pretty useful. Technical training and the like, which Vast could apply to his own neural augments to learn how to fix things with the skill of an expert. But perhaps most valuable were the personal logs that the human had made just before the end of their life, and after finding himself a place to sit, he took a look at the logs, hoping to at least know what happened to this ship. Personal Log Jimmy Lawson Lorchadea Chief Engineer Soul Date March 17th, 2948, 11.37am Cause of premature awakening Catastrophic damage detected so, we've apparently hit our first major issue. Somehow the comms, main reactor and various other major systems got banged up real good. Me and the senior staff are all woken as per protocol, and we're going to assess the damage. Here's hoping it's not too bad. I'd hate to wake the captain up and tell him the mission's gone foobar. 5.30pm Well, shit's officially foobar. But it isn't unsalvageable. Got the team working on it. Won't have to wake the captain up after all. It's just going to take some time to get everything working again. At least we won't have to worry about food and medicine. There's enough here to last us a few centuries at minimum. Still, from what I've been told, something doesn't really feel right. 
everything damaged was not due to some weird freak malfunction. It looks like sabotage to me. Not sure who'd be crazy enough to try and sabotage a colony ship, or why, but if this is the case then we have a problem on our hands that I don't think we're prepared to handle. At least, my team isn't. We're engineers, after all, not fighters. But here's hoping that there is no saboteur, and it's just a freak accident of some kind. Personal Log Jimmy Lawson Lorchidea Chief Engineer Soul Date March 20th, 2948 6.02am We've been working around the clock trying to get things fixed. Comms are fried beyond repair, even the backup systems. Reactor, though, is fixed, so that's a plus. Life support is a bit wonky, but it's holding for the time being. I got a few of the team working on making a new comm system and patching it in. The software is perfectly fine. It's the hardware that's screwed. On a personal note, though, I feel like I'm being watched. I know we're the only ones awake. I checked. Every passenger and crew member that's not us is tucked away in their pods, and yet I can't shake this feeling that someone or something is watching me. I asked around and the others are feeling the same way. Maybe it's just the situation and nerves talking. Maybe being so far out into deep space is starting to mess with our heads. Hopefully it's just stress. That's handled easily enough. Personal Log Jimmy Lawson Lord Shadea, Chief Engineer Soul Date March 27th 29.48 3.19pm Jimenez is dead. It wasn't an accident. Found her stuffed in a supply closet on one of the decks we aren't using. Clearly someone wanted her to remain unfound for a long time. But who? Nobody on my team has any history of violence, beyond the odd self-defense incidents that a few have. So who and why did someone kill Jimenez? Security systems didn't record anything, which is not right at all, because they haven't recorded anything. Not even us waking up. It's like we don't exist to the ship's internal sensors. Either way, I'm instituting a buddy system, just in case this ends up not being a one-time incident. If, God forbid, it happens again, I'm going to raid the armory and find out who exactly it was that killed her. And when I do, I... I don't know what I'll do. Personal Log Jimmy Lawson Lorchadea Chief Engineer Soul Date March 30th 2948 12.01pm Shit's gone to hell in a handbasket. Four groups have gone missing. The rest of us are paranoid as fuck, thinking it was someone else amongst our little group that's been doing the killings. I swear, all it'll take to make things get worse is a little emergency alarm to have us killing each other. I still believe there is someone else awake besides us, but that's not possible because our pods are the only ones empty. I'm going to go check again, this time with my own two eyes. Personal Log Jimmy Lawson Lorchadea Chief Engineer Soul Date March 31st 2948 1.07am So, I guess I'm the only one left. I went and checked the pods, found out that I was right. There was someone else awake. They just knew how to spoof the system into thinking they weren't. I went back to tell the others, but when I got to them, they were already dead. I failed to keep them safe. Alive. That's on me. But I wasn't about to let their killer get away with it either. Speaking of, Bastard tried to get me while I was putting the others to rest. Needless to say, they were not what I was expecting. Not a human at all. A sycanthi. Nasty buggers. Best damn killers in the galaxy, or so they say. Anyway, in the tussle I managed to break one of their legs, and they decided it was time to leave. Apparently these things are supposedly fearless, but let me tell you, I saw actual fear in their eyes. 
They ran off and I followed, taking my time. I guess he'd forgotten we're pretty good hunter killers too, because he seemed surprised when I caught up to him. I wasn't even winded. Anyway, I wore him down pretty quickly. Didn't even waste time with some speech or unnecessary violence. Just a quick jerk, and there was one dead Sycanthi laying on the deck with a broken neck. After that, I didn't know what to do, so I searched him for any sort of evidence. Not that it'd do me much good. But I at least wanted to know why all this had happened. Turns out, we were the target of some extremists who didn't want to be connected to the operation at all. Didn't want to get their hands dirty. The Sakanthi was hired by the Frional hierarchy. Granted it was through some extremists, but the government was the one funding those extremists, it seems. Guess the contact for our dead assassin was a bit too talkative. I don't know why this group targeted us, but the Vril know are known technophobes, so I guess that might have something to do with it. Considering how reliant we are in technology made of metal and not trees. Either way, they almost succeeded in their attempt to teach us heathens a lesson, but they picked the wrong species to mess with. That said, there's no repairing the latest damage to the ship. The Sakanthi took out the engines, and we only had the parts to repair minor damage to them, not rebuild them completely. Besides, I don't have the manpower, or the authorization to wake anyone else up. Not that I want to, either. I did a check. I discovered there was a virus uploaded to the system after we woke up. Anyone else gets activated and they'll be killed, instantly. Not a good way to go. Of course, the automated wake-up protocols still function, and we are still firmly on course with the star system we picked out. If we make it there, then everyone dies. Can't let that happen. So, I guess that leaves only one choice for me. Gotta keep the ship from reaching its intended destination. With the main engines out, we're just coasting along on momentum. Which means I can use the secondary thrusters to push us off course, to send us to God knows where. It might buy us a little more time. Trouble is, eventually, we will also run out of power. So I'm gonna... I'm gonna shut down everything except the sleep pods. Life support. Artificial gravity. Everything. Let the pods feast away on the power for as long as possible. On the slim chance that someone, anyone, will find us. And put things right. I guess... I guess this is it then. If someone finds this, make the bastards pay for what they did here, and get these people to safety. Chief Engineer Lawson, signing out. Vask stared at the words on the inside of his helmet, a sense of excitement and sadness battling within him. On the one hand, he'd found one of the most famous lost starships in galactic history, on the other hand, this human had been through the ringer and paid the ultimate price. It was sad, and he felt for the human who had spent his last days alone and probably terrified. But he had saved many, many lives. Vars perked up a bit as he thought about it and rushed from the bridge, racing through the corridors as fast as his magnetized boots would allow, following the signage on the walls towards the Sasis pod bay. He had to force open a few doors, but he eventually made it, and found the room awash with the dull blue light of a thousand pods. He checked the closest one, and found that the human within was still very much alive, and didn't even look to have aged at all. He nearly triggered the reawakening procedures, but remembered that part about the virus, and so stayed his hand. At least the passengers and crew were still alive, but he didn't know what to do, till an idea struck him. He had decades worth of engineering experience in his suit's computer, and a floating field of debris right for salvage just outside. Perhaps he could rig up some sort of beacon. With haste, he had the suit extract all the necessary skills and knowledge, and upload them into his own neural implant, which started to burn inside his skull slightly. He bared his teeth and hissed in slight pain, 
but it was over in an instant. With new knowledge burning brightly in his mind, he ventured back out into the void. A few days later, his mission was complete. He'd rigged up a beacon and a power source, so that he wouldn't have to tap into the ship's power banks and turn it on. Now all he had to do was wait. He did so on the bridge, which is where he set up the beacon. It took another two days for anything to happen. The beacon shorted out, but not because of shoddy construction, but because someone else had shut it down. He started to panic when he noticed that something was happening outside. Space bent, a thing space most certainly did not do, and then it tore itself open. Wispy tendrils of violet and emerald light curled around the edge of the tear in space, and from it emerged three large ships, each bearing the heraldry of Earth. They settled into a formation that suggested they were prepared for battle, but he only knew it was a precaution, especially out all this way into uncontrolled space. The lead ship broke formation and slid up beside the derelict, repulsor arrays pushing what debris remained of the pirates out of the way, while it forced a seal on the docking ports. And even though the airlock had to be about half a mile away, Vas could still feel the vibrations of very heavy footsteps through the floor. He raised his hands in surrender, just in case the humans were a bit trigger happy today. He didn't want to die by accident after coming so far. Through the doorway strode white armoured soldiers carrying large weapons, and those weapons immediately pointed at him once he was spotted. But they did lower just a little, once they determined he posed no threat to him. He was escorted silently to the human ship, which had docked with the derelict, and he was finally able to remove his helmet. An intense debriefing followed, but he was assured that he wasn't in trouble. If anything, he would be remembered for all time as the person who'd helped save the Orchid, his contributions placed right beside those of the late chief engineer and his team. A week passed after his rescue and Vask found himself in a distant world of humanity. The same world that the Orchid had been intending to colonise. The colonists from the ship were alive and well, rescued from their purgatory, and told all about the situation. As for his old crew, they soon found themselves without jobs, for the abandonment of Vask was unacceptable. On another world, the Vrilnol government received word that all trade, all immigration between their worlds and those of humanity, were to cease immediately. Worse, as news spread of the attempted murder of the Orchid and her passengers, other species began cutting off all communication with the Vrilnol as well, leaving them blind to the galaxy at large. It was not what most call for. Many wanted to go to war for this attack, but Caller has prevailed, and decided it best to just forget about the Vrilna entirely, unless they started causing problems. But if they did, if they attempted to lash out at the rest of the galaxy for this course of action, they would find a single human dreadnought on the edge of their capital system, hidden behind layers of stealth generators and bristling with weapons. A reminder of just who they had been messing with. A dreadnought called... Lord Judea. <laughs>